Welcome to the Volvo Ocean Race. It is day 11 of leg six, and overnight race leaders Team Max and Abel have lost it underneath the cloud. Let's check out the virtual tracker and see what the moves are out on the water. As you can see, all the fleet is down now into the southern hemisphere as they approach uh, the Solomon Islands and the rest of the doldrums. But life is tricky out at the back of the fleet with Team Mafre and Dongfong race team, the red boats that have been setting the pace thus far all the way out the back. However, look at what is going on at the, at the front. They had a strong lead yesterday with Team X Nobel, but then the, the night comes and so do the clouds. You can see all of the speed evaporates as Sung Hung Kai Skateweg slip past them into the lead, and it's now uh, the hunter becoming the hunted. Anyway, tricky, tricky situations coming up with dark blue real doldrums this time and uh, the navigators are going to really have to earn their crust this time, which is why I spoke with Libby Greenhouse, navigator on Sung Hung Kai Skerewag, about the overall strategy and what life is like at the pointy end of the fleet. You're always pretty pleased when uh, Skeg comes in and you've uh, rolled over the lead boat. Um, I think it was a little bit of a surprise. We had seen there was quite a big cloud that they might be in, but I um, thought we'd make a few miles on them, but uh, punch into the lead is nice. Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty... Uh, interesting leg so far and there's still whatever 1900 miles to go and uh, the next 1900 miles look almost twice as hard um, but yeah I think it, the cloud activity again has been huge as we saw on the way up here because obviously early on in the race we had a real struggle and chose to go north and it didn't pay out and we were on the back foot and ultimately that always kept us in a southerly position and then ultimately in a, in a westerly position and then as we approached this area of light winds, it was relatively clear to us to sort of, you know, our option was to try and push south. Or in fact, we talked about the fact we really needed to go to 220 to get through the light winds to get into the westerly. And that was kind of not our only option, but probably the best option to make a gain on the fleet versus, you know, consolidating the loss, so to speak, and heading more east towards the fleet. So um, we pushed through the through the transition and um, you can see on the ASCAT winds, the westerly wind was there and maybe a little bit little bit stronger and um, you know, there was an element of crossing our fingers. And uh, when we got through, it was there and uh, paid dividends for us. How is it like for you settling into this new team? What's, what's, what's the life of Livy like? <laughs> life of Livy's pretty good, actually, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's always one of those things, stepping into a team in quite a key role within a team when, when you're halfway through the race. You know, I have to, I, I have to admit, you're always going to be a bit nervous about that. Um, relatively speaking with Team SCA, I came in quite late with them as well. So it's probably something that I'm not, um, you know, or I'm relatively aware of. And I think, you know, in a way, one of my strengths as a as a person is is my ability to communicate and get on with people and, and adapt. And so I think, you know, while, I, while I'm nervous about it, I also think it's probably something I'm, I'm quite good at doing. And the big question here and for the fans watching is sort of which way you're going to go on the way to Auckland and are you going to run out of food on the way there? <laughs> uh, we're definitely not going to run out of food. We bought 22 days and I'm pretty sure we'll be in before that time is up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting, the routings that I've run um, over the last few days have had us going anywhere from heading pretty much towards Brisbane to uh, going the other side towards Fiji and almost having like a 800 mile uh, westy split between some of the routings over a 1900 mile leg so or part of the part of the race so it's pretty um, spread the options so I guess sort of for me it's quite a, quite a nervous nervous position to be in in terms of what is going to happen and, um, you know, notoriously um, model, weather models struggle to predict the kind of doldrums and, and light wind area. So, yeah, we're looking at it. I think there's a low pressure that's developing towards the uh, end of the leg that is kind of what is pivotal in how the weather routing is working. And if that continues to develop in the way it is, then it looks like um, the fleet will probably be pushing pushing west and uh, doing a big old banana to get to uh, New Zealand. There's nobody else listening right now, so it's just, it's just you and I. Uh, can you tell me which way you're <laughs> going to commit to? Uh, right now, I don't need to make that decision for two days. So fortunately, I've got two days leeway to really... 
build some confidence in the way that I would like to go. Um, I think there's still going to be the element of when you're in the doldrums, you can only go where you can go. And at the moment, it looks like it's quite uh, light and upwindish. So ultimately, that will probably, I mean, if it's a southeasterly wind and only five knots, then ultimately that's going to push us west. Because if you're on the other tack, you're going to be going north. So uh, <laughs> I think that'll uh, definitely play into some of it. Um, and then I think in, yeah, probably a day and a half, two days, you kind of have to really make that decision. So we'll be waiting till then. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Libby. We await uh, your decision with interest. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out in the next couple of days. Anyway, thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk to us. No worries. Take care. Cheers. Thanks. Big choices coming up in the next couple of days, and it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. However, at the back of the fleet, as I said at the top of the show, there is Mafre. They're the overall race leaders at the moment, and they are in last place. Clearly, they're not used to being there at the moment. However, spirits are still high, as we'll see in the conversation with Blair Took. Obviously, we're all human, so it's a little bit frustrating to um, end up right back here and with such a massive uh, gap to the lead. But, uh, you know, it's, it's still a long way to go, and there's a big light air period. So we're um, very optimistic, and we're going to keep, keep pushing hard. But, um, you know, the... That transition from the trade winds was certainly a pretty tough one for us. Um, we Probably when we first came into it, we got caught in a bad cloud, which may be a bit unlucky. Everyone caught up, and then from there we kind of um, had the wrong approach as to how we were going to transition into the monsoon winds. And um, the guys that sort of continued just straight south um, got into them a lot earlier. We thought we were going to have to go more to the east and, and get, ar um, get around a bit of light breeze to connect to the to the westerly breezes, um, but those guys cooked into them pretty early and um, you know that's when you, you saw Axel and Scallywag almost 300 miles ahead of us, so um, yeah, it was a pretty tough uh, 48 hours there for a bit, um, but no, we're optimistic now that we can um, catch up, especially with this big, big area of light wind ahead, um, so no, all good on board. One question I've got for you is coming from sort of the, the, the noise online in the, in the uh, in the blogs, and that was that you guys got carried away with a match race with uh, with Dongfeng Race Team, and sort of took your eye off the ball on the on the bigger picture. Is there anything to that? You know, for sure, they're, they're our main um, competitors in the race at the moment, um, so we you know keep an eye on them probably more so than the other boats. But um, you know, the truth is that you know Juan and um, Xabi thought that the best way for us to get to the monsoon breeze was going to be to. Um, transition through the, the east and then get around this bit of light breeze and that was um, sort of what their plan was too um, but you know all those tacks we sort of did um, to get east would have been better off just to go um, south at that stage um, so no um, you know luckily for us it looks like hopefully we're going to get another opportunity to get back to at least the guys just in front of us um, which would be, be nice to have another crack at it because um, we have done some Really good sailing this leg. We've had the boat going pretty fast, um, which has been pleasing for us. But, uh, you know, a couple of the, the transitions we've really struggled with. So we'll have to, if we get another crack at it, do a better job. Um, you know, we're still, still very hopeful and um, positive that we can. Uh, but talk to me about Scallywag. You know, what do you reckon that has been um, sort of the, the key to their success? <laughs> yeah, obviously, the first leg uh, on the way up from Melbourne to Hong Kong. You know, it was the first time they'd done well, so it's a little bit of a surprise. But um, you know, if they, you know, they're doing well again here, so they're obviously doing something, you know, better than us at the moment. And uh, you know, truth is, they maybe sailed a bit more of a direct, direct route. I'm not sure. If, and um, yeah, they've obviously been getting on the right side of some clouds. So uh, you know, that's that's good for them. But you know, like, hopefully we can get on the right side of some of those soon. And um, you know, if, if we get the chance to to catch back up to them, but it's still, um, you know, close to 200 miles ahead, which is quite far, but um, when you've got a brick wall of no wind in front of you, it's, um, and you can keep moving, it's actually not that far. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll get a crack at them, but they've been, they've been certainly doing a good job on these two legs, um, you know, up over the equator um, to Hong Kong and back. Boats like Scallywag uh, coming back in through the fleet and, coming, and presenting themselves as being more competitive. Uh, does that mean that you guys are, are more concerned now? 
you know, we're only halfway through the race, so we're going to have to keep getting better. Um, but it's, we always knew that boats are going to, um, you know, learn and, and get faster throughout the race because some of them joined quite late. So um, I think it just makes for a more exciting race and, you know, all of us on board are, enjoy that close racing. So it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite good to see. So um, no, not, not too much more pressure for us. We just got to keep, keep doing what we're doing. And obviously, um, it was, you know, a little bit tough leg up to Hong Kong for us, but um, still very um, positive that we can pull a good one out here. If we sail the rest of it um, smartly, we'll have to sail very, very smart and not get too many of the decisions wrong. Um, and then uh, we'll take it from there once we get to Auckland. Great sportsmanship there from an Olympic gold medalist and America's Cup winner. Blair Took is clearly used to being at the very, very front of the fleet. Uh, and so it's nice to see that he's still got such great morale on board and they're not going down without a fight. However, if Sung Kung Kai Skateweg uh, managed to hang on to the lead that they have and Team Max Nobel still trailing in second place, let's have a look at the, what those overall standings would look like. Well, Mafre and Blair Took still way out in the lead with a, with a proper three-point lead over uh, Dong Fong race team. However, this would allow uh, Sung Kung Kai Skadiwag to really secure that third pot on the, spot on the podium, leaving everybody else to fight for the smaller places. Team Brunel, who's sort of been in the middle of the fleet all the way through the race, well, they're there in the middle of the fleet uh, with Vestas 11th hour racing dropping down because they're not participating uh, in this league. Team X Nobel are on the rise, as we saw yesterday with, uh, with Roscoe Monson. Lots of inertia and positive movement on that team, uh, followed by Turn the Tide on Plastic, who are still struggling to convert uh, their continued progress into results uh, on the leaderboard. While the fleet might be approaching the Solomon Islands, we are here in Alicante in southern Spain, and it is Sunday lunchtime, more or less. My producer, Digby Fox, well, he loves his food, and he wanted me to be talking about Sunday lunch today. So to give you a little bit of an intro into what the sailors are eating out there, we've got a few packets of freeze-dried food here, and I invite you to join me to have lunch. Now, so this is freeze-dried food. Uh, this is more or less basically, you know, you know those packet soups that you get in, in the supermarket? Um, that you can reconstitute really quickly with, uh, with boiling water. That is exactly the same technology that these, um, that these little packets of joy, these little chestnuts here, uh, are made out of. So unwittingly, you have um, been eating freeze-dried food potentially for years. What we have in here is puree with minced beef, uh, or in French, puree de pommes de terre à la viande de bœuf hachée. Sounds better that way, doesn't it? Um, and so it's just basically flakes of tasty goodness and um, ah, a few spices. And um, I've, I've done three races around the world. I've spent literally hundreds of days at sea, and I have eaten just that for days and days and days on end. So I'm fine with it. I don't have any problem. I'm a little bit impartial. However, Digby, if you're listening, can you please tell us your thoughts on freeze-dried food? I wouldn't feed it to a dog, Conrad. It's absolutely revolting. I've had to eat it on a couple of fast nets. Um, and for legal reasons, it's nothing to do with the brand or anything like that, uh, but it, it, it's just quite disgusting. And I can pretty much assure you that uh, any of our viewers watching this uh, around Sunday lunch will not be eating anything like this. And I tell you what, Conrad, I don't understand why they don't take proper food on these boats. They're all one design. They could all kind of load on, you know, 500 kilos of decent food, uh, why, why suffer with this kind of revoltingness? Well, you tell me. <laughs> I, I will tell you, Digby, and the reason for that is because there's just not that much space. If you can imagine 10 people, uh, hey, Will, how long are they, are they gonna be at sea for on this leg? Uh, 21 days, I think. 21 days, all right, fantastic. So, 10 people on Turn the Tide on Plastic, 21 days of food. Can you imagine if you went to the shops and got, um, you know, got normal food, just how much space that would take up inside the boat. And so here you've got unbeatable uh, caloric content in a small package. Anyway, the way that you prepare this is rip off the packs and, uh, <clears throat> and then you take your conveniently pre-boiled water in there, stir it around without burning your fingers and stir it up, seal the package. However, top tip, one of the things that I've discovered, um, <laughs> having sailed around the world a couple of times, is that 
it's not so efficient to be reconstituting the food in here in the little bag that it comes in because you end up with sort of crusty corners and it gets pretty nasty. Um, so instead of sealing it up in there, pro tip is that you put it in one of these or ideally a sort of thermos bowl. So you pour it in there and then you can really stir it up well and then you can add a little bit of, a little bit of oil. Now, uh, Giovanni Soldini, a very famous offshore Italian sailor, he likes to do a sort of 50-50 split between oil and boiling water, and then you want to add a little bit, of, little bit of spice, a little bit of um, little Tabasco or something like that, and then sort of stir it up, and then, then you pop it down. Oh, look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? Puree, boeuf, there we go. Yeah, okay, How, how's that? Would you want to eat that non-stop for three weeks? Huh? Four or five times a day. Anyway, we'll pop that into a corner so it can um, sort of reconstitute. However, this would not be a proper cooking show without me whipping out one of these that I prepared earlier. So this has been um, cooking, cooking uh, for a good 20 minutes now. And Will, you're an offshore sailor, aren't you? All right, now, now this is um, curry, chicken, pasta. Come and have a taste of this. What do you reckon? It's delicious, delicious. Looks delicious. There we go. This is one that's been cooking for a, for a few minutes now. Yeah, well, I Can mean, you do a taste test. Texture's pretty uh, pretty loose. Not not much to it, but uh, I'll, I'll have a little taste if you like. All right, please do. Curry chicken, good. I mean, there's a, there's a good amount of flavour to it, but. I, just, I really haven't got to do much chewing to get this down, to be honest, so... Um, well, there you go. Yeah. Life on board is easy. You know, it's pre-chewed, reconstituted mush, which is um, really dense in calories and allows you to sail all the way around the world. You can just keep on eating there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's not too bad. I think, I think yeah, a little additional... What is it? Some olive oil you've added here? Yeah, so we've got some extra olive oil. We'll add but, some more but, there, yeah, yeah. get some more calories. And if but, you can uh, just show that to our lovely viewers there, get it up nice and tight. Oh, hold <laughs> up. There we go. Looking good. All right. Well, I hope that you're enjoying your lunch. Keep on going. As Off much it. as well is. <laughs> and so with that, we will leave you today. But don't forget to tune in uh, tomorrow where we'll be talking with another offshore sailor, Jen Edney, uh, most notably in OBR uh, in this edition of the race. And so drop your questions down below and we'll be sure to get the inside view on what it's like to be taking photos offshore. Join you then. If you play your cards right, you can escape from being on watch. And the French school has been known to start at 8 in the morning. Only the cry of all hands on deck can disturb the deck of cards below.